It's midnight and you're tuning in to Nightline with me, Azaria Tagaya. The top stories... Itu memang betul. Idea-idea dia orang. Kalau 50,000 lebih. 2022 budget, wow factors in store for the people. And moratorium under Pumule package still open for applications. Good morning. Barisan Nasional BN has decided not to cooperate with Parti Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia Bersatu in the upcoming Malacca election. The coalition's chairman, Datuk Sri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi, said the grassroots wishes against working with Bersatu must be honoured. Kita jangan dimanipulasikan untuk ditunggangi semula. Maka, ketetapan itu harus dihormati. Kita tidak akan pernah bekerjasama dengan PPBM di dalam PRN Melaka ini. He said this at the launch of BN's Malacca election machinery in Kuala Lumpur on Wednesday night. The BN chief said the decision was made to meet the needs of the people of the state apart from the demands of the current political state changer. Nomination day is set on November 8th with polling on November 20th. The 2022 budget will possess certain wow factors as it was drawn up to benefit all quarters in line with the Keluarga Malaysia concept, which assures that no one will be left out in the country's recovery agenda after experiencing difficulties brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob said that the 2022 budget was by the people, for the people, and would be of high impact, encompassing aid for the B40 and M40 groups, as well as support for businesses to ensure that the micro small and medium enterprises have funding to activate all businesses. At his interview with the media on the budget on Wednesday, the Prime Minister also shared that besides continuous assistance for the vulnerable and non-vulnerable groups, the 2022 budget would also generate more jobs in tackling unemployment and in enabling the recovery process to return the country and its economy to the pre-COVID-19 pandemic state with new norms in place. He added that the budget was drawn up carefully and comprehensively, taking into account the views of all quarters, including the opposition parties, so as to meet their aspirations for Keluarga Malaysia togetherness. Uh, fokus bajet ini menyeluruh kepada semua pihak. Cuma mungkin dari segi jumlah bantuan ataupun bentuk bantuan yang mungkin agak mungkin akan berbeza lah dari segi kategori-kategori yang berbeza tadi. Tetapi seperti saya sebutkan tadi, tidak ada siapa yang akan terlepas pandang oleh pihak kerajaan dan kita akan bagi kepada semua pihak. Termasuklah M40 yang selama ini merasakan mereka uh, tidak diberikan perhatian oleh kerajaan kerana mereka M40. Jadi kita fokus kita kepada B40. Tetapi kali ini kita beri kepada semua. The Prime Minister said the Finance Ministry's 2022 budget portal had received over 50,000 suggestions from the public that were considered and taken as part of the input for the budget that was all-encompassing and transparent. He said it also took into consideration the input of the business sector, such as providing tax incentives to assist companies adversely impacted by the pandemic to revive their businesses, hence also benefiting their workers. The budget also ensures the continuity of the policies and assistance to support the people and businesses so as to remain resilient in facing a crisis and to continue protecting their income. It will also enable post-pandemic innovations so that they could rise again stronger and more competitive in tandem with the country's development that is more sustainable and encompassing. On top of that, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri said the government will still be providing aid directly to the people and to micro-entrepreneurs, especially those who were forced to close up shop and with no capital to resume their business. At the same time, Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri said that the welfare and well-being of civil servants will not be forgotten in the 2022 budget. The Prime Minister said the service of 1.6 million civil servants in the country has always been appreciated by the government and the general public. Kerja awam sangat penting kepada negara, kepada pembangunan negara. 
Dan of course Kerajaan tidak pernah melupakan Pejabat dakwah Tapi tunggulah Saya tak boleh umum apa-apa lagi Ini pre-budget kan Lepas budget nanti Kalau kita berjumpa lagi Saya akan detailkan Apa yang diberikan Jadi tapi Percayalah Kerajaan sangat menghargai penjawat awam. He said the budget will also support the education sector, which had been long affected by the closure of economic and social sectors, especially through the digitalization agenda and the provision of educational facilities and assistance to the B40 group. The 2022 budget will be tabled at the Dewan Rakyat by Finance Minister Datuk Sri Tengku Zafrul Abdul Aziz this Friday. Borrowers who are in need of financial assistance may still apply for the moratorium under the National People's Wellbeing and Economic Recovery Package, Pumule. First, Deputy Finance Minister Muhammad Shahar Abdullah said the banks are ready to provide loan repayment assistance to those in need and they only need to contact their respective banks. Sekiranya menghadapi sebab kesukaran semasa berurusan dengan pihak bank atau permohonan bantuan bayaran balik pinjaman ditolak, mereka boleh menghubungi Bank Negara Malaysia secara terus melalui BNM Tenerlink di talian 1-388-5465. Muhammad Shahar also said that on October 14th this year, the banking industry introduced the Financial Management and Resilience Program URUS for the bottom 50% income group B50, namely households earning up to 5,880 ringgit who are still affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. He said this in reply to an oral question from Shah Alam MP Khalid Abdul Samad on whether the government is extending the moratorium to individuals and enterprises and whether the government is going to introduce a moratorium without accrued interest. In order to boost vaccine production efforts in the Southeast Asian region, Malaysia has suggested that ASEAN and Japan explore the possibility of seconding their expert researchers to the ASEAN Centre for Public Health Emergencies and Emerging Diseases. Prime Minister Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob said this effort would help to address the regional shortage of vaccines and prepare for possible emerging diseases. He said Japan's contribution for the center is important and its timely establishment is vital to assist ASEAN member states in dire need of assistance to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. He also said ASEAN and Japan should enhance multidisciplinary cooperation in health to better prepare the region to meet future health-related emergencies. Touching on cybersecurity, Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri said ASEAN and Japan should further consolidate cooperation through the ASEAN-Japan Cybersecurity Capacity Building Center. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida also attended the summit, his first since being appointed to the country's top post early this month. He also noted that Malaysia appreciates Japan's support and contribution towards the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 and Japan's vaccine contribution to ASEAN member states. The 24th ASEAN-Japan Summit was held on the sidelines of the three-day virtual 38th and 39th ASEAN summits and related summits, which began to Tuesday under the chairmanship of Brunei. Malaysia has been elected vice president of the 75th World Health Assembly, WHA, that will convene in Geneva next year. Health Minister Kairi Jamaluddin in a tweet on Wednesday thanked all the World Health Organization, WHO Pacific Region member countries for unanimously nominating Malaysia for the role. Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah said the decision was made during a closed-door session on Wednesday at the 72nd WHO Western Pacific Region Committee meeting that will take place until Friday in Himeji, Japan. Malaysia will represent 37 countries in the Western Pacific region, including several Southeast Asian countries, Australia, China, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand. The WHA acts as the ultimate decision-making body of the World Health Organization, WHO. It is a platform that brings together all 194 member countries of the WHO and also determines the policies of the WHO. Malaysia hopes it will be able to fully reopen to international tourists as early as December this year. Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister Datuk Sri Nansi Shukri said at the moment the government only allowed international travellers to visit Langkawi beginning November 15th and would observe the developments there.
Kita bersiap sedia dari segi kita punya prosedur, SOP dan juga apabila sudah nampak dia macam okey je walaupun kita meletakkan 3 bulan. Saya rasa tak sampailah 3 bulan ya Muhammad. Jadi saya rasa bolehlah kita buka awal daripada itu. Jadi kita doakan agar ianya boleh berlaku dalam masa yang dekat lagi selepas 16 November ini dan mungkin awal bulan Disember insyaAllah ya. Itu bukan janji saya tetapi kita cuba, kita usahakan. The Minister earlier said that under the International Tourism Travel Bubble Pilot Project in Langkawi, it would be a benchmark to open more international travel bubbles to other high potential destinations based on the review from the National Security Council and the Health Ministry before it was brought to the Special COVID-19 Pandemic Management Committee chaired by the Prime Minister for it to be considered. According to her, under the Domestic Travel Bubble Project in Langkawi, the island received an estimated 100,000 visitors from all over the country between September 16th and October 15th. Meanwhile, the Malaysian Association of Tour and Travel Agents, MATA, on Wednesday welcomed the Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister's statement on the plan to reopen Malaysia's international borders by this December. Its Secretary General, Nigel Wong Chen Thiem, said, most importantly, everyone must ensure that the standard operating procedures, SOPs, are adhered to at all times. What the Minister, uh, Datuk Sri Nancy, has mentioned uh, echoes the sentiments of tourism players throughout the country. The quicker we can reopen our borders to international arrivals, the better. Now, in terms of SOPs, I think uh, the Minister is also right in that industry stakeholders are very well accustomed to the needs uh, of travellers, uh, especially with regards to safety and hygiene, uh, and also the need uh, to implement these SOPs correctly in order to protect not just the tourists, but also the locals at these various uh, tourism hotspots. Now, that being said, there are still items uh, or SOPs rather that need to be clarified uh, as we go along, especially with regards to arrival policies. And I think on that note, the government agencies involved need to work a lot uh, more closely with one another and communicate these SOPs uh, clearly to industry stakeholders and even more so to engage industry stakeholders as these policies are formed. Six of the 37 initiatives identified by the National Task Force on Facilitating Private Institutes of Higher Learning IPTS as Industry or Pumuda IPTS are expected to be completed by the end of this year. Higher Education Minister Datuk Sri Dr Noraini Ahmad said her ministry's National Economic Regeneration Plan Punjana Career Enhancement Programme was implemented at the same time. Dua pula adalah melaksanakan program penjana KPT Camp IPTS berbentuk reskilling dan upskilling disasarkan kepada graduan IPTS yang belum mendapat pekerjaan selepas bergraduate. Pihak IPTS diberi tanggungjawab untuk mengendalikan latihan dan kerjasama dengan pihak industri bagi menawarkan pekerjaan kepada peserta sebaik saja mereka menamatkan kursus. She said a total of 89 programs with a value of 18.8 million ringgit were approved to 16 IPTS that submitted applications until October 25th. She explained that other measures include intensifying sessions on management and consultation through regular meetings with the IPTS and representatives of the IPTS Association as well as the Ministry. The decision to sell Petronas's gas assets in Azerbaijan was based on a long-term commercial valuation as well as cost compression to ensure resilience and operational and commercial excellence. Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Economy, Datuk Sri Mustafa Mohamad, said it was part of the ongoing efforts to revalue Petronas's assets and business portfolio. Speaking in the special chambers of the Dewan Rakyat on Wednesday, Dato Sri Mustafa said these measures need to be taken to maintain a strong financial position. In this case, not only the assets in Azerbaijan are involved, but also other assets that have fulfilled their potential are also given consideration either for sale or for reduced asset ownership. He said the decision taken by Petronas is also in line with the group's strategy to ensure a focused, competitive and sustainable upstream portfolio. He was referring to opposition leader Dato Sri An 
Anwar Ibrahim's motion on reports that Petronas had sold gas assets in Azerbaijan for almost 10 billion ringgit following the government's insistence on raising Petronas's dividend payments by 25 billion ringgit to the government for the year 2021. Datosu Mustafa also stressed that the sale decision was not due to political pressure, although Petronas was directly under the Prime Minister. According to him, the assets in Azerbaijan had been identified as among the assets for sale or candidate for exit since 2019. However, the sale process took time to ensure the sale price of the assets could provide a fair and reasonable value and could only be implemented in 2021. Matsabu's son freed of drug conviction. This and more when we return. on Nightline, Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Raza on Wednesday lodged a report with the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC, against former Golden Sachs senior manager Tim Leisner on the 1MDB scandal. The move is to enable authorities to question, bring back or request a list of names that have been bribed as admitted from the United States Department of Justice, DOJ. The report was lodged at the MACC headquarters in Puchajaya. According to Datuk Sri Najib, early this year, his lawyer successfully won a case in the U.S. to get a list of names of individuals who have been bribed by Leisner. However, the U.S. government, through the DOJ, objected to the court's decision and prohibited any name from being disclosed. He said the list of names was also to enable action to be taken against individuals in the government and 1MDB who received the bribe from the former top officer of Goldman Sachs. In the meantime, MACC confirmed that it has received a complaint made by the Pekan MP. The MACC also, in its statement, will review and investigate the complaints involved, covering all aspects, before further action is carried out. In Pera, a soldier and a trader have been charged at the Taiping Magistrates Court with the murder of an army retiree. However, no plea was recorded after the charge was read out to Warrant Officer Muhammad Hafiz Ibrahim, age 34, and Muhammad Ahmad Muhammad Yusuf, age 31, before Magistrate Norfara Shahida Muhammad No. The two men were charged with murdering 42-year-old Muhammad Zaki Muhammad Alwi in a forested area near Salama on October 10th. The court set December 9th for mention. The son of former Defence Minister Mohamed Sabu, or better known as Mat Sabu, is now a free man after the High Court set aside his eight-month jail sentence for drug abuse. Justice Datuk Colin Lawrence Sequeira allowed the appeal by the 33-year-old Ahmad Saifu Islam to quash the conviction and eight-month jail sentence imposed by the Magistrates Court on June 24 last year. Datuk Colin, in his judgment, said the taking of only one bottle of urine had left open the possibility of contamination as 
as the same sample was used both by the police for the screening test and the chemist for the confirmation test. He said the failure by police to abide by the guidelines in omitting to take two bottles of urine has rendered the conviction flawed. Ahmad Saiful Islam was charged with using a THC-type drug at a hotel in Kuala Lumpur on January 5, 2019. Still ahead, the U.S. begins legal appeal to get Julian Assange extradited. Don't go anywhere. Line on to the foreign front, a Brazilian commission investigating the government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic has voted in favor of charges against President Jair Bolsonaro, among others. The charges include crimes against humanity after a total of more than 600,000 deaths were recorded in the country from the coronavirus. Seven of the commission's 11 senators voted on Tuesday evening to support recommendations contained in a 1,288-page report on the pandemic. The document calls for charges against two companies and 78 individuals including Bolsonaro, over the pandemic's enormous toll on the country. The report alleges that Bolsonaro's government pursued a policy of allowing coronavirus to rip through the country in the hope of achieving herd immunity. It also describes the president as the main person responsible for the errors committed by the federal government during the pandemic. However, there is no guarantee this vote will lead to actual criminal charges as the report's recommendations must now be assessed by Prosecutor General Augusto Aras who is expected to protect the president. The United States on Wednesday appealed against a British judge's decision to block the extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, arguing that concerns around the WikiLeaks founder's mental health should not prevent him from facing U.S. justice. Lawyer James Lewis, acting for the U.S. government, told the Court of Appeal in London that a judge in lower court had been wrong to rule that Assange could not be extradited because of a high risk he would commit suicide in a U.S. prison. A document outlining Lewis's arguments presented to the court said the U.S. had provided Britain with a package of assurances addressing the judge's concerns. The hearing is the latest stage in a legal battle that has been raging since 2012. Assange has been held in Belmarsh Prison since 2019 when he was carried out of the Ecuadorian embassy in London by police before being arrested for breaching his bail conditions. He had entered the embassy in 2012 to avoid extradition to Sweden to face sex offence allegations, which he has always denied and were eventually dropped. The daily number of COVID-19 deaths in Russia hit another high Wednesday amid a surge in infections that forced the Kremlin to order most Russians to stay off work starting this week. The National Coronavirus Task Force exported a total 1,000... 123 new fatalities in 24 hours, the highest since the start of the pandemic. St. Petersburg was one of the major cities that reported a new death toll record, registering 74 new fatalities and bringing the total to 23,576 cases, the second largest in the country behind Moscow. The number brought to the country's pandemic death toll to 233,898, Europe's biggest by far. In a move intended to stem the spread of the virus, 
Congress, Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered a non-working period between October 30th and November 7th when the country will observe an extended holiday. Borussia Dortmund ease into the third round of the German Cup. Sports coming up next. Sports Malaysian tower runner So Wai Ching marked his name into the history books after winning the Empire State Building run-up in New York on Wednesday. So finished the elite men's division race after conquering all 1,576 stairs in 10 minutes and 40 seconds. Meanwhile, Cindy Harris from the US won the women's competition with 14 minutes and 1 second in the absence of defending champion Susie Walsham. It is understood that winners were awarded open tickets by Turkish Airlines. Around 200 runners from 24 countries took part in the event, the world's first and most famous tower race, which also helped to raise funds for equity designs. On to football now, the German Cup substitute Thorgan Hazard scored twice as Borussia Dortmund beat Ingolstadt 2-0 at home to move into the third round. In a lacklustre first half, Dortmund's Jude Bellingham had their best chance when the England international hit the crossbar with a superb shot from outside the box. However, the host should have scored seven minutes after the restart when forward Steven Tiggers somehow sent his header against the crossbar from three metres out. Dortmund finally broke the deadlock in the 72nd minute when Azar tapped home a pass from Julian Brandt just after coming off the bench. The Belgian then ended any hope of an Ingolstadt comeback nine minutes later as he finished off another precision delivery from Brandt to seal the victory. And that's it for Nightline this time around. As we wrap, we leave you with the chilling footage of the Chernobyl ghost town, which appears to have been frozen in time following the evacuation of its residents due to the explosion of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 1986. Take a look. I'm Azaria Tagaya. Thank you for tuning in. Stay safe. <laughs>